Right, OK, well, I'd like to start by reading the content of a document to which Elizabeth Hobson, our Director of Communications, as well as myself and others, recently contributed. It's the Non-Feminist Declaration. <coughs> and today is its official launch date. This is the full text of the Declaration. Feminists attack liberty, justice, equality and meritocracy. They attack men, women and children and relations between the sexes. All feminist narratives have been shown to be demonstrably one or more of the following. Baseless conspiracy theories, fantasies, lies, delusions or myths. In many countries, virtually all institutions have been deeply corrupted by feminists and by people in positions of power bowing to feminist influence. These include governments, public sectors, media, family courts, education systems, academia, police forces, criminal justice systems, health services, military forces and business sectors. So pretty well everything, quite frankly. Feminists have been responsible for, or have exacerbated, many of the problems facing humanity today. They include disparities in the treatment, opportunities, choices, respect, protections and rights afforded to citizens. Non-feminist men and women constitute a sizable, a sizable majority of the global population. Feminist hegemony, therefore, has no legitimacy. Operating without the consent of the majority of citizens, many of whom suffer egregiously as a result of feminist actions. Feminists have long cultivated a culture of fear. Non-feminist men and women have been reluctant to publicly challenge feminist narratives and actions. We reject that culture, re resolving to speak the truth at all times and encouraging others to do the same. Individual feminists must be held publicly accountable for their actions. Recognising the growth of feminist aggression, we assert our right to exist and thrive without paying any respect to feminists or their ideology. We shall not permit feminists to dictate what we say, how we say it, or how we interact with the world. Given the extent of feminist entrenchment in institutions, we recognise that we are embarking on a project that may last for decades. But we shall not waver in our determination to roll back feminist influence over state and other institutions. With this declaration, we take a public stance in opposition to feminism and invite others to join us. The non-feminist revolution starts here. And that's the end of the declaration. I would strongly urge everyone in this room and those later watching the videos on YouTube to go, to go online and become a signatory. The URL of the website is, is on the placard. Feminists have achieved their political domination in part through exploiting some innate characteristics of women, most notably their anxiety, and some innate characteristics of men, most notably their deference towards women, ironically. Um, feminists must be the, the only group of people who work tirelessly to make women more anxious, <laughs> with the objective of making women see men as dangerous and therefore their enemies, with another objective of making women see feminists as their protectors therefore funding the livelihoods of huge numbers of otherwise unemployable uh, women. <laughs> in, in <laughs> Mainly in feminist industries such as rape and domestic violence. The truth is that the great protectors of women have always been men. Men are now, and always will be, women's protectors, regardless of how much punishment women as a class, and feminists in particular, meet out to men. Feminism is an offshoot of Marxism, so we shouldn't be surprised that the Labour Party in the UK is so anti-male. But for well over a decade, the Conservative Party too has driven feminist agendas, in recent years aiming, uh, aiming to be even more progressive, i.e. unconservative, than the Labour Party. I'm not aware of a, city, of a single sitting female Conservative MP who has ever spoken out publicly against feminism, not one. And only a couple of the sitting male Conservative MPs have ever spoken out against it. The current Conservative government doesn't give a damn about the breakdown of the nuclear family, which has wrought such devastating consequences on British society. In our last general election manifesto, we explored 20 areas where the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the state's actions and inactions, 
almost always to privileged women or girls. On this roller banner, we have 17 or 18 of those 20 areas. There is not one area in the UK today, not one, where the human rights of women and girls specifically are assaulted by the actions of inactions of the state. If this is oppression of, if this is oppression of women, I'm a sherry trifle. <laughs> the, the other side of the coin of female privilege is invariably assaults on the human rights of men and boys. This is a zero-sum game. For men to enjoy equal rights as women inevitably means that either women will have to lose their privileges over men, or men's rights will have to increase. For example, to have the same protection from the state against genital mutilation, which it gives to females. Now, because society doesn't care about the human rights of men and boys as a class, and men as a class haven't yet fought effectively for their rights, states can assault those rights with impunity, and they do so. Women campaign more effectively for privileges, for more privileges, than men do for their basic human rights. And because women's appetite for privilege is insatiable, as a class, women as a class, not all women, <laughs> um, so the human rights of men and boys will be assaulted ever more over time. Things are going to get a lot worse for men and boys, and indirectly worse for the many women and girls who, who will suffer collateral damage. Campaigning for men's rights will always be an uphill battle, so we could really do with a, with a way to frame our arguments to gain more public support. We need to campaign for men to have equal rights with women. It really does boil to, down to that simple demand. I'd like to thank Professor Eric Anderson, who will be speaking this afternoon, for a number of discussions on the distinction between men's rights and equal rights. And if we pitch this well, feminists and others who challenge us won't be challenging men's rights and men's rights organisations and men's rights, men's rights activists. They'll be challenging equal rights for men and women. And that will re re reveal them publicly to be the scheming liars they've always been. Women and girls in the UK, as in many other developed countries, are among the most privileged human beings to ever walk this earth. The fact that few women are conscious of this reality is possibly due in part to a toxic combination of female entitlement and narcissism. For decades, women and girls have been fed a constant diet of narratives along the lines of, women are strong, women are amazing. And for decades, so much of the fiction they've watched, heard or read has echoed this, this narrative. And of course, men have long been portrayed in fiction as violent, lazy, stupid, criminal and irresponsible, and more, simply feeding women's sense of entitlement over, uh, sorry, uh, women's sense of moral superiority over men. And there's no doubt as a class, with perhaps the exception of some women in this room, who, who I think are strong and amazing, women have, as a class, internalised the narrative of women are strong, women are amazing. A few months ago, I was interviewed for two hours by possibly the best-known businesswoman in the UK, Baroness Karen Brady. She was appointed a peer by David Cameron, the feminist prime minister before the current one. Um, Brady will be familiar to many British people in this audience as an advisor to Lord Alan Sugar on the BBC TV series The Apprentice since 2010. And the, the, the TV programme was titled Why Do Men Earn More Than Women? Grown. Um, I, I, I was actually shocked during our discussion by how very little she actually knew and understood about the issue of men's and women's earnings. She became so angry at, at my challenging of her arguments and assertions that at one point I, I honestly thought she was going to stamp her feet in frustration. Um, that may have been when I pointed her to the evidence I'd presented to House of Commons and House of Lords inquiries in 2012 of a causal link between increasing female representation on corporate boards and corporate financial decline. <laughs> the, the blood drained from her face at that one, I can tell you. So um, anyway, l less than four minutes of our two-hour interview made it into the 45-minute long programme. And it was the only section in the programme in which she was challenged, and of course she sought to, put, to portray me as a dinosaur. But to my amazement and delight, a short sequence that was broadcast was when I said to her, I, I thought with very, very heavy irony, women are strong, women are amazing, women need gender quotas. <laughs> to which Karen Brady replied, thank you, I agree with you. <laughs> I could say a lot more about the cultural narrative of women are strong, women are amazing, but time is limited. I'll just say that as a class, I believe women are becoming more dysfunctional with every passing year, and less happy too. 
So there's a selfish reason why women should, should support men in the war against feminism. The more progress we make together, the happier women will be too. Now, men are particularly prone to shaming by women and will agree to the most absurd things in order to end it. Um, women have surely always shamed men to do their bidding in the private sphere of the home. But since the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, 170 years ago, they've become ever more proficient at shaming men to do their bidding in the public sphere, the world of work, politics, and so on. As a party, we used to issue awards, <coughs> some of them are here, um, such as Lying Feminist of the Month. And so this is the, this is the award we, we gave to Sophie Walker, leader of the ridiculous Women's Equality Party. Um, but we stopped issuing them after, after feminists started writing to me, nominating themselves for the awards. <laughs> that was so annoying. Um, um, feminists are utterly shameless when it comes to pursuing their cause. Maybe women could make a better job of shaming feminists than men have so far. So I turn now to politics. Um, very often women haven't attained political power through merits, but through the shaming of men again. It was male MPs, after all, who, who, in the main, who agreed to feminist demands for all women shortlists, leading to ghastly women such as Jess Phillips becoming MPs. She, she, she's the toxic feminist who infamously tried to stop Philip Davis hosting the first ever debate on men's issues, um, uh, and on suicide in particular, in the House of Commons on International Men's Day 2015. Suicide has for many years been the leading cause of death in the UK in every age band under 50. Philip Davis spoke at the second conference in the series in London two years ago about the justice gender gap, and it's about to get worse. Uh, um, uh, William Collins talked on that, and I know Jordan will be saying more on Sunday. So the driving force behind most feminist initiatives is the shaming of men, but men need to stop accepting class guilt for the actions of a small number of men such as murderers and rapists. Women wouldn't accept class guilt for the actions of a small number of women, and nor should they. Why, why, why should they? Let's, let's just take one example. Um, the small, well, the, the, the group of women who sexually abuse children, including boys. In 1984, two, two American researchers, Petrovich and Templer, reported that 59% of imprisoned rapists in a Californian prison had been sexually assaulted when they were children by one or more women sometimes their own mothers. At the recent male psychology conference, Naomi Murphy, the lead forensic uh, psychologist at Whitemore Prison, spoke of her work with serious violence and sexual offenders. 54% of the men, of those men, had a history of being sexually abused as children by women, usually individual women. I turn now to the bigger picture. It's time for more people working in the men's rights movement to accept a harsh reality all the better to work more productively in future. We're not at war with feminism, other than on the internet, I'd say. Uh, but with every year that passes, more people understand that feminism is a fraud and has been from the outset, maybe 170 years ago. But this increasing public consciousness has yet to make an impact in the offline world, which is where laws are passed and power is held and wielded to advantage women and girls at the expense of men and boys. Feminists won their war against men and boys decades ago and have only slowly been exerting their power so most people are blind to it. I'd like to repeat a paragraph from the non-feminist declaration. In many countries, virtually all institutions have been deeply corrupted by feminists and by people in positions of power bowing to feminist influence. These include governments, public sectors, media, family courts, education systems, academia, armed forces, criminal justice systems, health services, military forces and business sector. End of paragraph. It may take decades for non-feminists and anti-feminists to destroy feminism as a political force, and that struggle has barely begun. Feminism, feminism can't be destroyed as an ideology, but it must be destroyed as a, as a political force for the sake of men, women, and children. And I look forward to the, ele the election of politicians with an interest in men's issues in countries, particularly those with proportional representation voting systems, including Australia and Iceland. I'd like to focus on the world of work for a short time, where the much vaunted empowerment of women is, of course, code for the disempowerment of men. And it's, it's almost invariably through the corruption of due process. In the UK, we've seamlessly moved in recent years from feminists demanding women have equality of opportunity, always a ridiculous demand, since women have had equality of, of opportunity for decades, 
to demands for equality of outcome, regardless of the relative numbers of men and women who are well qualified for senior positions, to take just one example. Many, many men in this country are unable to find paid, paid employment or don't get the promotions they deserve on the grounds of merit because they're the victims of women's manipulations in the areas of recruitment and promotion. This has long been the case in the public, it's endemic in the public sector, but it's becoming ever more common in the private sector. In most large organisations, the majority of the senior positions are held by men. Uh, feminists, of course, have their ludicrous glass ceiling cons conspiracy. Um, and um, in a rare show of wit, possibly, for, 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 for uh, feminists, feminist clerics talk of a stained glass ceiling. <laughs> That's rather good. Um, the, the, the explanation for the phenomenon of men holding most of the senior positions in large, large organisations um, the main explanation was published in the year 2000, 18 years ago. It's mentioned only rarely in the mainstream media, but I'm pleased to have with us in the audience a world-renowned British sociologist, Dr. Catherine Hakim. In 2000, she published a paper on what she termed preference theory, in which she revealed that while four in seven British men are work-centered, only one in seven British women is. Her theory explains much of the, gender dispar the, the numerical gender disparities we see in the senior levels of large organizations. Now, much of the anti-male corruption of recruitment and promotion processes happens out of sight. But we recently had um, a case of an institution proudly outlining its corruption of due processes. <laughs> this is a belter. Um, the institution is the, is the Treasury, which handles the, re the recruitment process for some appointments to the Bank of England. The Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee is charged with setting the Bank of England base rate. It meets eight times a year. Five of the committee's nine members are employees of the bank, including the governor, a Canadian feminist, Mark Carney. Um, the four non-staff members are drawn from the, from the country's top economists and are appointed for terms of four years. Now, it happens that over 90% of senior economists in the UK are men. Economics is just a field that, appear, that, that appeals to more men than women, more, more men than women. Likewise, engineering, maths, physics, and, uh, and uh, a number of other fields. One of the nine members of the committee, one of the non-staff members, is a woman. Now, there was some, some excitement in the media as one of the three male non-staff members on the committee was approaching the end of his term, so a new member, so a new member had to be appointed. Now, I remind you that over 90% of the top economists in the UK are, are, are men, so with a process that was meritocratic rather than ideological in nature, over 90% of those invited by the bank to apply would be men. Let's say a ratio of 10, 10 men for every woman. The Treasury approached 43 male economists and 44 female economists, a ratio of almost exactly one to one, not the 10 to one we'd expect on the grounds of merit. Of the 43 men invited to apply, 19 did so. Of the 44 female economists, uh, only eight did. So individual men were almost two and a half times more likely to apply than individual women, which may say something about the work ethic gender gap. Of the 19 men who applied, just one was shortlisted. So let's call that 5% of the men. Of the eight women who applied, four were shortlisted, 50% of the women. So not, not, not only was there a tenfold preference in the original invitations, there was a tenfold preference for women over men in the shortlisting process. It doesn't end there. Two of the three people on the interview panel were women. So it gives me enormous pleasure to inform you that the successful candidate was one Professor Jonathan Haskell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only man, of course, on the five-person shortlist. And ironically, that's why we know the details of this corruption of due process. After the, after the Treasury announced the appointment, Rachel Reeves, a Labour MP and Chair of the House of Commons Business Committee, described the appointment of a man as truly staggering. <laughs> it's always good when, women, when feminists are truly staggered, I think. It, 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 it means there's been some good news. <laughs> now, the, 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 the Treasury then made public the corrupt recruitment process um, as if to say, look, we did everything we could in a desperate bid to appoint someone with a vagina, but we failed. Sorry. <laughs> I looked at the coverage of this story in the mainstream media and was una unable to find so much as one article in which politicians, economists, journalists or others criticised the Treasury for its corruption of due process. They, they reported it, 
but didn't themselves comment. I turn now to the mainstream media. The lack of coverage of men's issues by the mainstream media and their lack of challenging of feminists is, of course, um, a long-running scandal. But it's too easy to say that the mainstream media is riddled with feminists, editors and journalists, though of course it is. As a movement, though, I think we need to invest more time and energy in trying to engage with the mainstream media. And as a party, we'll, we'll certainly be doing that. We have more journalists from big media organisations. Uh, we have more journalists from big media organisations at this conference than at previous conferences, and I think that direction of travel will continue. Only recently, I was one of nine men in an hour-long BBC TV discussion on their f on their flagship Sunday morning debate programme, The Big Questions. The question that day was: Is masculinity in crisis? Um, so nine men. We were seated in a semicircle with the audience behind us. I was positioned on the far right, predictably. <laughs> but the, the, the important thing was, and really quite startling to me, was that four of the men, including Professor Eric Anderson, who we'll be hearing from later, and myself, self-identify as either non-feminists or anti-feminists. The BBC wouldn't have had anything, anything approaching that number just a year or two ago. That, that was really a remarkable development. Now, the presenter was Nicky Campbell, a male feminist, and he did all he could to direct uh, questions towards the left of the semicircle, towards the feminists, and in particular to a young man at the, at the far left end who wore a shirt with a pattern of red hearts. Uh, the young man explained he lives half the week as a man, half of the week as a woman. He makes a living from, from uh, his drag queen act. To the BBC, he was clearly an inspiring example of masculinity in the modern era. <laughs> I'll say no more. Um, after I'd outlined my, my point that the human rights of men in, in this discussion, after I'd outlined my point that the human rights of men, in the boy, men and boys in the UK today are assaulted by the state's actions and inactions, almost always to privilege women and girls, the young man trotted out, parrot fashion, something along the lines of, "We live in a patriarchy in the UK, in which men as a class oppress women as a class for the benefit of men." Now, had Professor Jordan Peterson been in the lineup. I'm sure he'd have responded with some very finely nuanced arguments. As it was, out of sheer exasperation, I found myself shouting, rubbish. <laughs> I've been told I might benefit from some media training. <laughs> <clears throat> I turn now to an area that causes great suffering for men and their children, denial of access following family breakdowns, Germaine Greer wrote the following in 1970, almost half a century ago now. Women's liberation, if it, if it abolishes the patriarchal family, will abolish a necessary substructure of the authoritarian state. And once that withers away, Marx will have come true willy-nilly, so let's get on with it. End of quotation. Lack of access between fathers and their children is a scourge across much of the developed world, certainly including the UK. Malicious women deny their ex-partners access to their children, and are aided and abetted in this by family courts, law firms, and others. It's nothing less than state-sanctioned child abuse. And it, in my view, these the, uh, women who deny access should, should serve a pr prison sentence long enough to deter them from doing so a second time. It's also emotional abuse of their ex-partners, and it's a testament to men's stoicism that so many of them um, do manage to carry on with their lives despite being denied access to the children. If I had to choose just one area where men and women should enjoy equal rights, it would be parenting. In Warren Farrell's book, The Boy Crisis, he cites a 2016 survey of social workers, the report on which uh, included this conclusion. Social workers tend to consider the, the children's wishes as long as their preference is for maternal custody. When children expect a paternal preference, sorry, when children express a paternal preference, their wishes carry no weight. End of quotation. Um, and Farrell goes on to explain that since the mid-1970s, the, the, the National Organization for Women have supported the mother's rights to choose who parents a child after divorce. And in Farrell's words, mother's rights trample, trampled equal rights. Politics tr trumped equality. There are many consequences of fatherlessness for boys, among them mental health problems, physical health problems, educational problems, and employment problems. In the United States, virtually all mass shootings in schools and elsewhere have been carried out by, carried out by men, or, men or boys who are fatherless. Who are fatherless. And last October, um, a 63-year-old American, Stephen Paddock, opened fire from his Las Vegas hotel room towards a crowd attending a music festival, 
leaving 58 dead and 851 injured. The deadliest mass shooting committed by an individual in the, in, the, in the United States. Paddock never had a good relationship with his father. Here in London, we have an epidemic of knife crime and murders carried out mainly by young black men in gangs. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick, has pointed to fatherlessness as a common, as a common denominator in these young men's lives. It's easy to forget sometimes, though, that feminism harms not just men and boys, but many women and girls too. Feminists have never been remotely troubled by all that collateral damage. A few years ago, I was in a debate with the delightful Julie Bindle at uh, Durham University. She's actually quite a funny woman, you wouldn't believe it. Um, in the bar afterwards, a number of the female students came up to me and said that they were feminists. And all of them, all of them, unprompted, told me that they had not been in touch with their fathers for a great many years. The breakdown of the nuclear family achieves a number of things for, for feminists, including the generation of ever more feminists. And you've got to ask, what are the odds that these fatherless young women will go on to have successful, long-term, intimate relationships with men? Not high, I suggest. I have a question for the men in the audience. Um, if you're about to leap out of a plane at 5,000 feet for a, a charity jump for charity, sorry, a parachute jump for charity, and you're, you're informed just as you're about to jump that there was a 50% chance of your parachute not opening, um, would you still jump? If, if so, please hold your hands up. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, <laughs> But the odds of a marriage in the UK today ending in divorce is around 50%, and wives, wives file for three quarters of divorce applications. Yet men still walk down the aisle. It's as insane as jumping out of a plane, knowing there's a 50% chance your parachute won't open. Just a few words on the rise of the MGTOW movement, men going their own way. MGTOWs build, build lives without the risks that long-term intimate relationships with women entail, principally by not marrying. They've adopted a perfectly rational response to the conspiracy of women and states and law firms keen to destroy men financially and emotionally. I look forward to ever more men going MGTOW until those assaults come to an end. I turn quickly to our campaign on male genital mutilation, MGM, which is illegal in the UK, being at least actual bodily harm and almost certainly grievous bodily harm under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. In the coming months, I shall be launching a private prosecution of a circumcising doctor it's time to hold these criminals personally responsible. The maximum sentence following a conviction of grievous bodily harm with intent is life imprisonment. A few words on the men's rights movement. I think we're actually in great shape and growing all the time, but we need to do more to challenge the toxic alliance of states and feminists. It will require men in particular to spend less time working online and more time working offline where power is exercised. That is the next, next necessary next stage in the evolution of the movement and I leave you, uh, and I look forward to working with, with, with others on it. And I leave you finally with a few words from Victor Hugo, the French writer. You can resist an invading army, but you cannot resist an idea whose time has come. The idea whose time has surely come is equal rights for men and women. Thank you.